Okay, so the next and last talk today is by Robert Lampman, so is he, again in connection with Dan Marshall's uh, stage story. Lampman was here on the faculty for uh, five years. I'll explain. And then he left the department when Dan was chair. <laughs> Well, it's not quite like that, and I should perhaps say a couple of words. Uh, first of all, it's uh, very pleased to be invited to speak here. The uh, Wolf Prize is a prize of which ma mathematicians can be proud, and it's good that they've wisely added Dan to their list of recipients. Now, actually, I can't resist just recalling a few, in a few words, my relations with Yale. I, because my relations with Yale, were, although brief, were exceptionally good. I came here first a long time ago in 1958. I still remember my arrival. I came a little early because uh, I had a wife and we were about to, about to have a son and I wanted to make sure that everything was arranged so that she could come here without too much trouble. So I arrived a few days early and was looking for an apartment, but I also was very eager to see the department. I'd come from a long way. I came from a long way by train from the west coast of Canada. And I still remember the first arrival, I wanted to go to lead Oliver Hall. I came up, uh, Charles Rickert, who was professor then, and somebody else were walking over to George and Harry's that existed then too. And uh, I eagerly explained what I was, who I was and why I was there. And they t told me to go home and wait for a few days. So uh, that was uh, the beginning. But those were actually, I, want to ins I just wanted to say once, I've said it in print once, written it in print once, that those two years, I was at Yale only two years, they were two very good years. I had a chance of going to two other graduate schools, and one reason or another I didn't go, and I've always considered myself as very fortunate to have gone to Yale. They were two f basically free years. Uh, if you go up the stairs now, the, the, the lead Oliver Hall was not connected to at Dunham Laboratories, and but if you go up the stairs and across the bridge, then on your left is a room, and at uh, that time, 58 to 60, that room was empty. There was nothing there. There was a table, I think, there maybe for meetings of the faculty. So I had that table all to myself, and I spent, I would say, every day there, from morning to night, and I read a lot of books. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was a good in introduction to a very varied kind of mathematics. There was Hiller. Hiller's book on functional analysis and semigroups is a very good introduction to, was a good introduction to classical analysis, probably still is, especially the Laplace transform. I remember reading uh, the first volume of, uh, God, I'm getting old. The, who's, who wrote the book on Fourier analysis? Oh boy, you're, you're younger than I am. No, the poll. Zygmunt. I remember reading Zygmunt there, for example, and Marshall Harvey Stone's book on spectral theory. And, and all those things uh, actually served me in good stead uh, in <coughs> later years. In the second year, I was at, fortunate enough, I was, took a, Stephen Gall, who was a mathematician who came here after the Hungarian Revolution, was here for a brief time, but he was interested in, in uh, Selberg's work, partly because he was a number theorist, partly because Selberg's wife was Hungarian, and they took an interest in him. And so I was introduced uh, to Selberg by him in the second year. And uh, what else? Oh, yes, uh, thanks to uh, Felix Browder and Kakatani, who never got along, uh, there was a seminar on function theory of several complex variables. And thanks to this seminar that never took place, I read for the first meeting of the seminar a book on uh, domains of definition of functions of several complex variables. Uh, and those of you who have come across, say, the early theory of Eisenstein theories know that that plays a role in that theory. So they were very good years, and I left. And then I came back again in 68, so 10 years later, Stayed only a brief time. I stayed four years, of which I was absent once. And then I learned a great, I started to teach myself the theory of Shamur variety. So that was, and I had one or two very good students, one of whom is here. 
Anyhow, um, so I was pleased, and I could hardly refuse when I was invited to uh, come here and speak in honor of Dan's 90th birthday and reception of the Wolf Prize. On the other hand, although I'd been thinking for some time about a particular question, and that was if I talked, that was all I could have talked about, I certainly was not ready, and I'm not ready today. And the best, but I couldn't refuse. So I'm just going, I thought as much as I could in the few weeks that were available about um, what I wanted to do and whether I could do it, and I would like, like to talk about that with all the provisional element that it entails. So let me try to try to begin. What I was thinking about, as you can imagine, if you the theory of, aspects of the theory of automorphic forms. Let me, be, I, I said it before, <laughs> but I'll say it again. Uh, I just want to remind you of some of those aspects of the general theory of automorphic forms. So one, there's the theory of, uh, over uh, a number field. And I've tried recently to, by the way, there are notes on the web for this lecture, and so I don't feel any responsibility to say everything that needs to be said. You can go afterwards. You can even go now if you happen to have the right kind of <laughs> tool with you and, and read the notes, which will be clearer than I am. So if you go to www.iaas.math.edu, and then you go to publications, and uh, then you go to something called Beyond Endoscopy. That's a section in these public. You go to me in the publications, and then you go to Beyond Endoscopy. You will find uh, this text, which has in the title the word Mostow and the word lecture, so it shouldn't be, not be hard to find. And uh, these are fairly clear, and as far as, as I can be clear about my topic at the moment. So first of all, there's a theory of, uh, of a number field. So for that, is, I'll just use language. The number field is f, and usually one has a group g, like gln, and the functions on the quotient space. G and G of A. This is the symbol that uh, Deline used, and we'll, I'll explain it again. But in any case, a function on a space like this is part of the, has a classical theory in it. And uh, so this is a basically, the, it's not the classical theory in any, in any real sense of the word, but it's the initial theory from, so, from which I started. And two, the, the theory for function fields. Theory for function fields over, over, over the, the theory for function field over the complexes. So for the field of holo holomorphic functions on a Riemann surface. All right, and then the third topic. So, so these are the three principal topics in my view. And uh, the third topic, so this topic, it, um, I want to say, I think it's fair to say, and uh, I could say for me, but quite frankly, or at least if I'm speaking frankly, I would say, Absolutely, and so for me and in general. In general, the principal topic here is fu functoriality. What, what, is, what is called in this particular area functoriality. It's not a formal functoriality. 
the functoriality that has to be proven. Now, this functoriality is, of course, closely real, I mean, contains, in particular, class field theory. Now, it occurs to me, it didn't occur to me before as I was preparing this lecture, but it occurs to me now, uh, the words of wisdom I heard here at Yale about class field theory, uh, that it's something that no intelligent mathematician learns. Uh, it's just beyond the pay, it's just beyond the pay. Uh, 19, 1959, it was perfectly reasonable. Class field theory was focused in Princeton, and, and I, uh, there's not only that, but in 1956, Arten says more or less clearly that there is no non-abelian class field. Not class field theory, but no non-abelian theory. Arten says that. No. No, I knew he, you would say no, but it's <laughs> if you look at the 1956 Princeton conference and read what Arten says, I think it's more or less that. I, I don't dispute it, but if you, I, I, I advise you to look for historical purposes at the 56 Princeton conference. And see what other people say, too. He may have thought differently and said differently at home, but in any case, he did say this. And this, this functoriality includes, includes, so in particular, if you could ever do it, in particular, an anabelian, at least I think it does, an anabelian class field theory. Now, I don't think that I know exactly what to do about proving it, but I think that we now have an idea of what we have to learn in order to be able to move towards that. And the kinds of experiments that we have to learn, the kinds of calculations we have to make, and so on, to reach a, a stage of maturity where we can do something about one. But that's not my topic today. My topic today will be two. But there's a third topic, and I want to draw it to your attention, just briefly. So it's the relation between, between automorphic forms on the one hand, and Diophantine, Diophantine equations. I just, I'm not going to say anything about it today. I can't say anything about it. It's not something that I've ever really thought about. But, so Diophantine equations, in some sense, that's rather a large topic. I mean, in the sense, say, of Grotendieck's motives. There, there's apparently a, a connection. We don't understand it, and we don't even know how to, how to go about understanding it. And, but I just suggest that, of course, and dealing with this problem is probably tied up with serious advance in the theory of al in, in algebraic geometry and the theory of Diophantine equation. I mean, it's, in other words, Groden, we can't forget that Grotendieck's view implies a particular solution of the Hodge conjecture. So you're at least there. Right? So this, the two questions seem to be intimately related. It means that it's kind of a surprise that no one is trying to look at both of them simultaneously. All right. But I want to discuss this. It's this two. Two I don't understand, and it's out there. And uh, one would I would like to understand just what it's all about. Uh, it's not so obvious. The, the literature is fascinating. It's a subject that it's, of course, related to a lot of things. It's related in one way and another to differential geometry, one way and another to the theory of moduli spaces. So it's a very rich subject, and yet it's, I find it very difficult to discover exactly what it's all about. Um, this, the thing is the following. Thing, so I'll, I'll explain. It... it um, Basically, if you look at the subject, if you look at the, the, the literature, what you'll see is 
that there's a parametrization, you see, a parametrization of automorphic forms. Let me speak a little bit loosely by connections. That seems to be the theory. Now, this, this is the theory that for GL1 is available and, and due to V is reproduced in the book of Griffiths and Harris. It's the one place I could find it. All right. So this is a theory. And so this is the parametrization of automorphic forms by connections. Now, this is par this parametrization. By connections could be, it's the equivalent it's of functoriality in the context of, uh, it, we'll come back to this, but in the, con in the geometric context, it's really this, this parametrization by connections or by the integrals of connections with no periods that uh, corresponds to functoriality. Functoriality is the following. Uh, so reality is one introduces with any group G, one into, this is over F. F in this case would be a, a number field. F in this case would be a function field of a Riemann surface. One, when one has G over F, then one introduces a second group G of the same type. This is a, a reductive group. This is the reductive group over C. And what functoriality does, it says that some way or other, what, that if we ever we have a natural hom a homomorphism of HL, which is a, a reductive group over C into GL, then we have corresponding map from automorphic forms or automorphic re representations of H to automorphic representations of G. And there's a, there are a lot of technical questions that come that come about here, for example, uh, questions of related to endoscopy. Endoscopy is not a word that most of you will have heard, I don't suppose, but it's, it's the, uh, the fundamental lemma for which Go was awarded, I guess the uh, Fields Medal, it, it, it is a part of endoscopy, so just to give you an idea. It's nonetheless, from a general point of view, a more technical question. Do you remember your response to Rappaport when he told you what was being talked about at the seminar that I gave at the Cours Normale de Vinci? No, no, no. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so what, uh, by the way, I'm tired, so I, <laughs> all right, now, but, but here's, the, here's the thing, it's actually a troubling thing. Um, what you read about, when you read about sort of geometric Langlands program, you read about something altogether different. Uh, namely, uh, I would like to understand it someday, but I don't understand it yet. This uh, deals with a theory which was introduced the, these questions of, of uh, automorphic forms in this form appeared about 1967. I think that Matonin and Olive came later, and quite so far as I know, indep independently. Um, and they introduced concepts which involved G over F over C and GL over C. So the duality between G and GL was between, as far as I can see, I, I've started to study uh, the relevant literature but haven't gotten very far. There's an entirely different theory, and this is the theory that that's, goes by the name, basically is this theory, to which the word Langland's program is attached. This theory 
which 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 compares forms for G and GL, but over C. So there's no over a function field. I'm sorry, they're not over. I guess they're over over a function field. It, it's, uh, it's very confusing. Lots of things are confusing. And, and one of my next goals is to understand, to understand the Langlands program in the sense in which I think it's usually meant. I, 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 for a long time, I, I didn't realize that. I, you know, ordinarily, one has the experience Mathematics that things are attributed to other people that you think are due to you, <laughs> but here I, I have to be, it's, it's quite quite different, and I don't know. I just look, and I don't know what to say. <laughs> huh? No, 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 no. That's not clear. I, you really want to know. I, I, I don't know yet. It's maybe maybe I will. Maybe I'll take it, but I haven't bought it yet. I just would like to know what it's about. Oh no, I mean, it's obviously interesting, but I. I and it's worth worth learning as a, but I'm after all a mathematician and not a physicist. And this is <laughs> whether to my regret or not. Duality, something like that, yeah. Yeah, as I said, I would like to learn someday, and that's one of my projects for my old age. But uh, I, I'm I'm not quite ready. It's it's more complicated than that, I think. Yeah. All right. So what I want to do now is, so what happened was that I would like to understand the, this, uh, the geometric theory in, sort of in the mathematical sense, namely the, the functions. Uh, uh, so where functoriality is related, I said I'm tired, so I want to be careful. So I want to, so in the second sense, in any case, the mathematical sense. But this, this is, after all, I've said it's a theory which, in, which does involve a lot of geometry. It d involves connections, the properties of connections. It involves uh, uh, classifying space, the properties of classifying spaces, and so on. And, what, uh, and I think you, there's a real solution. I think one can handle functoriality in this case. It's probably considerably easier than in the arithmetic case. But nonetheless, it's very complicated, and you can very easily discover that there are a lot of things there that you don't quite understand. And uh, I've tried to put them together over the past weeks it's because I, I want to see, can you really prove it? In other words, can, do we know enough to prove it? So let me just remind us. I don't know about whether the other speakers have learned what I've learned. but. Other people's stocks go so slowly, <laughs> but one's own stock goes by so fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me just say a few things. And, and, and let me tell you why I think, in fact, we're dealing with something which is, ex which is accessible to us now if we know the right, the pertinent theories. And, the, and, and we work hard on them. So anamorphic forms. So let me remind you, our functions on G, F, over. So this is a group like G L N. This is the this is a field. It could be a field of rational numbers, but that would be the arithmetic theory, or could it be the field of functions for Riemann surface? And that's our principal case today. And then we have G A. This is the G adelic. So this is roughly speaking, this is something which. Is, uh, uh, Special is a restricted direct product of the local f. Each, each of these is the field of power series over the local field at, at v, so let's do it x. That's this, and this obviously embeds in that. And um, we can do function field cases. In any case, we can do ramified, unramified. It doesn't make any sense at this stage to do. To, to introduce ramification, so we really want functions which are invariant under the under the uh, under the g of x where that's in integral, so the, the, where those are power series, the coefficients in o x are, are power series. <laughs> now, this is 
on the face of it, a disagreeable object. Right? This is an infinite dimensional group. Right? And it's not, it's, an un, it's a difficult situation to divide by a disagreeable group. It's, it's just too big. I mean, so, and all sorts of bad things that can, can happen. Now, you understand right away that all sorts of bad things that can happen. And, and here's something that I want to observe. Uh, you think that you have to understand Stein. Now, I, I want to confess this, that after thinking about it a long time, I decided you have to understand why stacks are there and necessary, but you do not have to understand stacks. And in fact, maybe it's better off if you don't know stacks. <laughs> this is not such a trivial philosophical position, because there are people, I mean, in the 19th century, sets pushed out other things. And I think in this century, uh, there's a certain kind of functor reality that's pushing out other things. And those of us who grew up without, without functor reality are attached, you know, not so much to numbers, but at least to sets. A and so we, we have to fight back, if we want to fight back. Uh, so, and, and what, what seems to happen is that, so you have to think of this as some sort of very complicated situation. You have, you're dividing basically this, which, which is a very, very big algebraic variety by something which is very, so you have enormous pieces. Well, one way or another, you bring it down to pieces of reasonable size, but still, you know, the, the, the nature of the group fixing a point varies from point to point. Sometimes very big, sometimes it's very small. But it seems to be, it's a kind of miracle, basically, a miracle that results in the Riemann rule, that the quotient is equidimensional everywhere. I mean, I, I, if I don't make a mistake. A, so the, this quotient, which looks so bad, is equi it really is more or less the same everywhere. I don't, I haven't got so far as to thinking about singularities. Equidimensional and even, even finite dimensional, although it has an infinite, perhaps an infinite number of components. So it, it isn't so pleasant. You have to think about it. Finite dimensional, but but big. But it has, and the thing is, if you're in algebraic geometry, you don't really like things to be so big. Uh, this is my experience. You really would prefer that they would be finite dimensional, they'd be complete, and, and that would be it. But this is not the case. Now, if you're, if you're an analyst, on the other hand, if you're an analyst, for, for you, basically, the theory, I mean, I, I just, maybe, maybe not. But, uh, uh, I, I'm sure this wouldn't have been the case for all fours, but in a, for someone who's sort of grow, grown up in the time that I grew up and uh, studied Harris Chandra and sorry, Selber, it's automobile forms or representations are really functions on this space, right? And I say, hey, this is finite dimensional space, but very big. Um, so, And the, you need, so, and the theory consists of two things. It consists, so, and I want to say this. In other words, one knows from one's experience with the theory of, of, of Fourier series that there's the usual theory of Fourier series. There is the Laplace transform. There is Paley-Wiener theorem. There is Schwartz. Hmm? But so maybe you know, so we could test people. Uh, we could see what the two color, what the two colors are. We ask them which of those they prefer. Now, now I think I like the one that's due to Fourier, namely, uh, basically the Fourier, namely the theory, the L two theory, right? and the others are adjuncts. Uh, the Paley Wiener theorem you may or may not want to learn. The Laplace transform you may or may not want to learn. Schwartz theory may be a, a, a distribution theory, maybe something, but. What I, what I want to say is I, th I'm not, I, I like this, and so I w would prefer that everything be expressible in L2 sense. Uh, I think the basic reason is that for L2, there's really a notion of completeness. 
For distributions, you never know quite to, when to start. Uh, what are the eigendistributions? Uh, for, uh, for Fourier uh, transform, for Fourier series, for every eigenvalue, there's a unique eigenfunction, or maybe just several. So we, there is a notion of completeness, which is just the theory of completeness of the, of the eigenvectors of a uh, emission operator. So it, it, it's quite standard classically. And on the other, the, the completeness, well, that's an advantage, I guess, uh, depends upon your choices. So we really need to make sense of this. All right. So I think it's fair enough when you when you read the literature. First of all, that a that it's a it's a manifold, complex manifold, and, and I'm not sure if I'm not sure this this space. Let me divide. Let me assume there's no ramification and divide by G O, O A sub A. So not the full thing, but the G O A. So that, let me get rid of that. And, and we need a complex manifold, and it needs to be a Kähler manifold. Now, I've been reading a paper of a T and Bot on exactly this kind of question. And so and I must confess, I find a very charming paper. Uh, I, I, I'm curious. I don't know if anyone has an idea where, whence the charm comes from Mattia or from Bot, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's not a question I can answer. But it, it, and I think that uh, so this, I mean, and part of the fascination is, of course, that this links everything up with Hamilton-Jacobi theory. Hamilton-Jacobi theory. So. It, it expresses to some extent the, the depth of the, the geometric depth. All right, so if, if you accept my reading of a Tiapot that it looks as though that we're using Hamilton Jacobi theory, one can make this into a complex manifold with a Kalian structure, then hmm, we're pretty far along. The, the, ne the, the, the central difficulty is the it, it, what seems to me the not the cent, not the central difficulty, but one difficulty is the Hecker operator. The theory revolves around the spectra. These are the operators whose spectral theory is to be examined and understood. Now, if you look. Uh, I mean, if you if you look at what is used, so I don't know. I mean, Grinfeld is the name that comes up to mind first of all when one thinks of the geometric theory and the theory of the Hecker operators. But the theory, but the Hecker operators are really defined in some sense by sheaves as they appear in uh, so. There is a problem. <laughs> there is a problem in getting a hold of the operators that define the spectral theory. Um, now, as far as I can, I can see, without having worked through it, the the uh, uh, I, I thought I wouldn't have too much connection with the uh, other talks, but uh, the some appropriate words were uh, notions were evoked in the other talks. I mean. I th this business of getting from cohomology or homology to integrals is, is what gauss bonnet does, and is what Goresky and McPherson do in a certain sense also. So I, I think it's surmountable. I, I'm not sure. I really, I've thought about it, but it, the difficulty is, is, as I say, when you take this quotient, everything is chopped up into, so you have, uh, well, what's the word that you, uh, they use in, with, in Goresky and McPherson? They have these various pieces and so on. You, you, huh? Stratific you have this terrible stratification, and, and you have to work with it. But if that's necessary, then you can presumably get by this in initial stage, and then you have a, 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 a spectral theory to examine. You just have to show that you have the complete set of eigenvalues and so on. Now. Let's just go on a little further. So, so it, it begins to look more like uh, an analytic problem, more or less. 
you know, I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than the than usual analytic problem, but nonetheless, that's what it seems to be. Now, but then there's a, another thing, so another central point, which confuses the, the innocent reader and confuses perhaps the not so innocent reader. It's a theory in which one has, so to speak, how do I put it? Put it? So there's, there's an analytic theory. The analytic theory, so it, it's, let me say this. There's, there's a difference between, say, an elliptic function even a holomorphic elliptic function. A holomorphic elliptic function is of the form e to the a z. Hmm? And it's, uh, uh, and so there, there's this function, but the z to the a z over e to the, over the absolute value of e to the a z and uh, absolute value of e to the a z. Hmm? And in, in an eigenfunction problem, it's these that occur. Absolute value, I mean, we take the, we take the exponentials of absolute value one. If you want to get a periodic function on, a, on, a, on, an ellipt, on an elliptic curve, you better take something like this, not something like this. Huh? So, and uh, as I said, if you look, uh, if you look at this, at Vey, Vey looked at, uh, there's no direct reference to Vey that I have, but he looked at this problem for GL1, so Edel class characters. And for he described the Edel class characters, but Edel class characters are things like that. And, but implicitly, is always around this. Uh, so, and, and, and what, you, what I discover on reading the literature is that no one carefully, I would say no one, I think it's fair enough, I mean, the, the theory, the theory, the general theory, say, for connections, I can find in, say, in Simpson's papers, probably in other papers as well, theory of harmonic mappings that I don't fully understand. But um, if, if you look, for example, someone from whom I've learned a lot, but who's quite casual about this, is that, uh, is that he does not distinguish between this and this. Hmm? Now, he doesn't ever mention them. Right? But, but his, uh, in, 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 in basically in Frankel's expositions, the eigenfunctions of the Hepp Hecker operator are those, but it's also perfectly reasonable, and in the L2 theory that I propose, it would be uh, perfectly reasonable to uh, take, to look for something like this. After all, this and the quotes are intimately linked. You can't get one without getting the other. And uh, it's, uh, it's very peculiar that, and, and, and this is the difference as I rethink the languages, the word that's involved is, what is it? The, I think the, this, the distinction is between flat bundles in the literature and uh, harmonic bundles. So this corresponds to the holomorphic theory, and this corresponds to the other kind of theory. And, and, and Simpson, for example, in his report that the Kyoto is very clear about the distinction and the equivalence between them and so on. So it's not, it's not something that appears here for the first time. And, and, and one is is a, is, is a theory which is approachable by, with an L2 theory with this with this, with this spectral analysis, the other is not. And if you look, and the other is the first one, namely this one is one in which it's quite easy to speak, na natural to speak of the eigenvalues, eigenfunctions of Hecker operators, simultaneous eigenfunctions, uh, whereas this one is not. And if you look, I, I, I describe it here, but if you look, for example, and I think it probably is taken from Drinfeld, it was probably hard to find, but if you look at Frankel's description of an eigenfunction of the Hecker operator, you will wonder 
for some time, if you're as stupid as I am, maybe not so for a short a time, if you're yourself, what he's doing all that for. And he's doing all that because he doesn't, if you only work with sheep, you, you can't introduce these things. Hmm? So, so something has to be done. I think it can be done. And then, then where do you go? Then where do you go? You see, if we have, so we're looking at, uh, now it's, this is a big space, but I say if you, if you start to look at this big space, this, this quotient space, and think about the functions, you'll see that a large number of them are Eisenstein series. And Eisenstein series are not treated always with respect, so they can be thrown away. And that's usually done, and what you're left with is a much smaller set. Uh, so it, it isn't that it's all, I mean, that it isn't that there aren't advantages to be gained in going to smaller sets. But basically, if you're looking for everything, you look for everything, at least everything which is relevant for the L2 theory. And then, let's say, then you get eigenfunctions. You get eigenfunctions in, in the L2 sense, in the uh, functional ana analytic sense. You get eigenfunctions. And, and the theory is, well, uh, the, these HECA operators are understood. You understood what the eigenfunctions are. And you really understand the unitary eigenfunction. So, uh, but these eigenfunctions are parameterized. The point is that they're parameterized by conjugacy classes. In this, in this group, even by semi-simple conjugacy classes. So, and and I recall, you, if you haven't thought I mean, about eigenvalues of Hecker operators, you you haven't. But the thing is that these Hecker operators are such that there's one. There's so to speak one part attached to each point. So you have the you have the x x is the Riemann surface, and to each point you have a, a, a conjugacy class. So you need to have continuous families of uh, uh, operators. So it's like von Neumann algebras. I once, when I was young, <laughs> made the mistake of reading a book about von Neumann, von Neumann algebras. I don't know. Uh, I never thought much about it. So you have so it, a, a, an eigenfunction of the Heck operator is a conjugacy class. So to each point x in, in bun g, you have a conjugacy class in the group. That means you have a you basically, if you with, with any luck, you have a conjugacy class in the algebraic group. Hmm? So you have a conjugacy class in the algebraic group. An algebraic group, and and then you get to, so I mean if you have one at every point, then you get I mean just by something algebraic you get you get one. That must be more or less a, a theory that's available from the standard theory of, of algebraic groups. So what we get sort of automatically in the in the unitary situation in the L two situation is we get the parameter that we're looking for. I mean, it's not so automatic, but you can see that how it goes. You, you have a conjugacy class at each point, so this is a function. And then sort of by standard theories of Cartan algebras and elements, you have, you have something. So the passage, the passage from the L2 theory to the connection Should be pretty much an exercise. I don't know. So, as I said, functoriality would be for in the algebraic, in, in the function field case, would be to say every automorphic, the automorphic forms that are eigenvalues of Hecke operators 
are parameterized by connections. Right? I, I've been a little bit careful about uh, integral. I'm really working with integrals of connections, and I really have to choose the integrals of a single value. Uh, but so, so that's one direction. And then you, you have to go the other direction. You have to go from a connection. You see, if one understands Simpson and so on, it, having a unitary connection in this sense gives me a holomorphic connection. And then, hmm? and uh, so uh, I, I should be able to go, this connection gives me a, a holomorphic connection. And uh, somehow or other, I, get, uh, I have to get back to the eigenfunction. I think it won't be so hard, but I don't really, uh, really know yet. You forgive me, I was doing things in a, in a rush. Uh, so that is somehow, if you like, it's a vision or an illusion of the way the uh, functionality might function in the geometric case. And if, I think if we could do it this way, if one could do it this way, it would be a lot clearer than some of the circumlocutions that are invoked. And there's no proof, oh, by the way, there's, there's in, in the, in, 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 in the so to speak, in the sheaf theoretic form that's uh, ex explained and advocated in a large number of places, there's a promise of a proof, but as yet there's no proof. So I don't know exactly what the situation is. But here I have the feeling that sort of I can see more or less how to work in one's way to the proper existence theorem. And there's an existence theorem which would then accommodate whatever the, the sheaf theorists, sheaf theorists, I thought of. What's the natural word for sheaf theorist in English? Huh? Huh? Well, I thought I posed myself the question. The word that comes to mind is fascist, of course, but <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, any, uh, anyhow, I, I would like to see that, and I would like to see a, ge a geometric theory, and uh, so to speak. I struggled for the past few weeks just to clarify my thoughts. I didn't make them very clear, but that's the best I can do. Thank you. Circumlocution you were talking about, I'm totally not an expert in any of this, but uh, is like a, a natural language that's occurring because of the language of quantum field theory and so on, and category theory that this phenomenon naturally fits into and helps understand. Well, uh, what I was saying at the beginning is I think the, the idea of functoriality in the geometric theory is something different than the, the ideas advocated by uh, Montone and Goddard. So, uh, and I, I, I don't think they they haven't. I've looked at the. I've read some of these papers because all the care I could give, and and I don't think that they're necessarily useful. I, but what is what is useful and important, it seems to me, is that the construction of the classifying space is hard. <laughs> uh, it has to be given some thought because of, of the, these groups are so big and because nature of, of, the, of, the fixed, uh, of the stabilizer of a point varies so markedly from, from one place to another. But uh, now I don't want to get, the, uh, one can see, and we can see in modern day mathematics, this pressure, which must be analogous to the pressure to deal, to use sets. Now, I'm happy to use sets. Kronecker wasn't happy to use sets, but I'm happy to use sets. So I really can't say to someone else, I, I'm happier with the function than with the sheaf. <laughs> but, but it is the case. <laughs> so, so my purpose is to is to make the <laughs> function theoretically clear and and smoother. Uh, but whether that's ultimately the case is hard to say. Ultimately, the case, you know, why do we all speak English? Not because it's a better, prettier, or more elegant language than various other languages. Because everyone else does it. So, it will be the same with. <laughs> Yeah. Function fields over finite fields, which you function fields over which finite recommended fields. Recommended to me the good thesis many years ago. Uh -huh. I still haven't taken <laughs> your advice. Okay, but they. But, but you know, th there are now some big theorems about. Uh, 
but, but for function fields over finite fields, this, this, this distinction, for example, between sheaves and functions is not so great. And, and uh, turned out to be a big advantage. What? Turn, but, but the theory is different, too. And uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but you s you one feature of the f function field appears to be that Ramanujan's conjecture is strictly true. The, the, uh, the trivial automorphic form does not satisfy. So uh, it appears to be that, th that the spectrum is entirely tempered. Right? When the, for, for over a function field, over a finite field, over a number field, the spectrum is not purely tempered. And, and it's, it's a bloody nuisance. Uh -huh. but, but here, I, I haven't really proved it, but I, I think it's not such a hard theorem. So, so, I, so I don't know. So, I mean, so it, 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 that's an important distinction, though, between the complex numbers and the finite field. Well, no, but but this 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 Grodin Deacon distinction. I mean, st you know, statement that that number of that that sheaves are functions is, is a state something over finite fields, okay. right? And, and that makes a big difference. Uh, I, I didn't say it uh, because I said I, th I th think that what uh, Atiyah Tia bought do this. That they show basically what they say show in their paper is that if one, so to speak, cuts, uh, they're only interested in the good part of the, of the classifying space, right? So, uh, uh, stable vector bundles and so on. And then what basically they show is that. With the introduction of a little bit of Hamilton Jacobi theory, you get a Calarian manifold. All right? So it's a question of, of extending that to the, the, the la I mean, maybe they have it someplace else, but for me at the moment, it's just a question of, of taking that remark and understanding it and uh, uh, making sure that it does, in fact, extend to the whole uh, moduli space. Oh no, it doesn't have measures. It carries the Eisenstein series. I mean, it, mm -hmm. I mean if you, if you take the most, I mean, one of the simplest cases is the case that the uh, the, the Riemann surfaces of genus zero, and then classifying space is discrete. <laughs> and some <laughs> some part, most of it, I guess, is belongs to, to things that uh, are, are, are not. What's the what's the phrase for? Uh, Stable, they're not stable, of course. So, uh, no, you don't lose them. They're, they're, like, they're a bit like the cusps in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, number fields case. Uh, but I, I don't, I realized this morning that I have a confused view of them. I, I mean, they're not like pieces sticking out, they're like little hairs <laughs> here and there, but I, I, I haven't thought it through. No, they should, they should, I say they carry the Eisenstein series. So for, for over uh, over a field of genus zero, they're, they're basically everything. <laughs>